Hello, and thank you for joining me today for the Spurlock Museum's opening for their new exhibit, Debates, Decisions, Demands, Objects of Campaigns and Activism. My name is Susan Morisato. I'm an LAS alumna with a BS and MS from the math department. I'm also a former member of both the Mathematics Development Advisory Board and currently a member of the Actual Science Board and of the LAS Alumni Council. And I'm your, I'm your host for today's event. On behalf of everyone in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences, we are thrilled that you could join us for LAS Impact 2020. Before we begin our event, I want to go over a few Zoom details. We will be recording today's event and all Impact event recordings will be available by mid-November. If you need technical assistance at any point during the event, please utilize the chat window. Mindy Spencer, our Director of Alumni Relations, will be on hand to help with any issues that you run into. Because this is a webinar, your camera and microphone will be off throughout the event. However, the chat box will be available for comments throughout the event, and we ask that you utilize the Q&A functionality for questions. Attendees will be able to read all the questions. You can comment on questions as well as upvote questions that you would also like to see answered. We will do our best to answer as many questions as possible, and we appreciate your understanding if we run out of time. Again, if you have any Zoom questions, please send them via the chat window. As a land-grant institution, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign has a responsibility to acknowledge the historical context in which it exists. In order to remind ourselves and our community, we will begin this event with the following statement. We are currently on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankashaw, Wea, Miami, Miskouten, Odawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. It is necessary for us to acknowledge those native nations and for us to work with them as we move forward as an institution. Over the next 150 years, we will be a vibrant community inclusive of all of our differences with native peoples at the core of our efforts. Now, I'd like to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Sutton, the director of the Spurlock Museum of World Cultures. Elizabeth Sutton is an anthropologist specializing in heritage management and California archaeology. She holds a BA in art history from the University of California at Los Angeles and earned her MA and PhD at the University of California at Santa Barbara, where she investigated Chumash household and community organization on the Northern Channel Islands. Dr. Sutton enjoys using museums as learning laboratories to provide students with training in all aspects of museum operations and research. Dr. Sutton also promotes a community-centered approach to museums and welcomes opportunities to collaborate with various campus and community groups to share their stories and experiences through museums, museum exhibits and programs. And now, Dr. Sutton. Thank you, Susan, and thanks to the whole LAS alumni team for helping us develop this very special event. I am grateful to all of you in attendance today for connecting to us on this historic occasion, which is our museum's first ever virtual exhibit opening. So thanks for joining us. If you enjoy this presentation, I would remind you that the Spurlock Museum is now open to the public. Um, we've made a lot of changes to ensure the safety of visitors and staff which you can read about on our website. Um, we've also been updating a lot of our exhibits and experimenting with new layouts. Um, so if you haven't visited us for a while, now's the time to do it, especially because um, parking on campus is really easy right now. Um, and also for those of you who can't join us, my awesome staff is um, busily planning other great virtual programming opportunities. So please, um, check out our events page on our website. I know we're going to have some great um, political trivia coming soon. That's going to be added um, to our website. So really excited about that. Now it is my honor to introduce Dr. Nathan Tai, the curator for our new exhibit, Debates, Decisions and Demands, Objects of Campaigns and Activism. Dr. Tai is an assistant professor of history at the University of Nebraska Kearney. He holds a BA from Creighton University and a PhD from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Dr. Tai specializes in the history of the American West and Midwest, labor history, gender and sexuality history, as well as digital and public history. So Dr. Tai. Oh, thank you, Elizabeth. 
And I want to begin our conversation today um, by thanking the Spurlock for everything that they've done to um, facilitate this exhibit. Uh, it's, a, it's a really unique time to be putting together a uh, museum exhibit uh, in these conditions, making things accessible. Um, and just and just trying to trying to make this event happen. So again, I want to thank uh, the Spurlock staff from from the bottom of my heart for everything they've done. Uh, the Spurlock was a very supportive environment uh, during my time as a graduate student. Was supportive of my research. Was um, supportive of, of of sharing my research with the wider Champaign Urbana community. And now uh, that I've that I've left campus, continue to be supportive. So the materials in, in our exhibit, this brand new exhibit, are it's a unique collection. It's called the People's Collection. And for those of you who have been to uh, the Spurlock before or might remember when it was the Museum of World Cultures in the top floor of Lincoln Hall, um, it's a museum that uh, shows a diverse uh, collection spanning centuries and, and all across the globe um, and, and really kind of emphasizing the, the diversity of human history and, and human cultures. Um, but it's it's not uh, at its heart an American history museum, but by any means, if you if you just step into the halls. Um, but there is this unique collection uh, that we're highlighting here today called the People's Collection, which is it's, it's an enormous collection of largely U.S. political ephemera. Um, there are also some English materials which will which will look like, look at. And so this exhibit really highlights the contributions um, of this collection but it is also complemented by the diverse holdings, the diverse global holdings of the Spurlock's collection. And so you're also gonna see uh, materials from all over the world and, and other time periods um, as well, kind of expanding on um, um, the, the materials here. So I, I welcome all of you. I hope you can all physically at some point come and see the exhibit um, or, or just enjoy kind of the, the materials that we discuss here today. And so, what we're gonna be doing today is I'm gonna kind of take you through the exhibit and we're gonna highlight some of the materials that are included in the collection and kind of telling some of the stories, the, the, the unique stories that are embedded in these objects. Um, the aim of the exhibit, and, and as we all know, you know, we're just a couple of days from a, a presidential election, that politics are embedded in our everyday lives. You know, they, they shape our society, they structure the possibilities of our politics and um, our culture. And they also drive our imagination for different futures and different, different types of possibilities. And these really become visible during elections. You know, during off years, politics are, we read about them in the paper, they're on the news. Certainly we read about the government, but it's, it's in these campaigns, in these elections where candidates, platforms and parties are, are rendered much more physical. Um, and we encounter them on, on a daily basis in a, in a much different way. Um, and so this has been a large part of American history since its founding, these, these kind of objects that epitomize um, our political uh, system and the people who, who embody that system. And so the thing that I've assembled here and, and, and we've put together in this exhibit are the stuff of politics, okay? so. After the issues that we debate on soapboxes and stumps and podiums kind of fade away, these things remain. And, and we often kind of forget or we need to contextualize what these things are. The issues of uh, the 1890s or the 1740s are not the issues of today, um, but these remnants of campaigns and voting and activist movements kind of in, uh, attend to the enduring power of democracy. And so this exhibit looks at these different aspects. We've, we've divided the exhibit into a series of different um, subunits, looking at campaigns themselves, looking at candidates, the active voting, and then activism, and how this shapes kind of the contours of American democracy and, and democracy on a, on a larger scale. So to begin with, you know, um, we just kind of have this, this eclectic collection. And this, this um, really kind of sums up, this is from the introductory text of the, the exhibit, kind of showing and trying to convey um, the, the, the cacophony of objects, this wide range of objects that we're going to be um, looking at. And it's, it's a very eclectic collection. Democracy and campaigns take many forms and, and produce um, objects that are 
quite unusual decades or a century later when you're trying to contextualize or understand them, um, as we'll see. But the exhibit really begins with, you know, the act of voting. And we've juxtaposed it really interestingly here in the exhibit, again, showing the strengths of the Spurlock collection with, with these two objects, where we have a demonstration voting device from um, the 1930s. This is from the 1936 election, FDR's first re-election campaign versus Alf Landon of Kansas. Um, and this automatic voting machine, um, which, was, which was gifted to the University of Illinois, kind of showing how this new mechanical process of voting was gonna work, and then we have it have it paired with here an ancient Greek coin demonstrating the act of voting. And so here you see um, voters receiving um, ballots, receiving little little markers um, in ancient Greece and, and depositing them in a uh, uh, ballot box, if you will. Um, and so we see the long tradition of democracy and the technologies that are producing that, but but ultimately how the actual act of voting hasn't changed all that much. Even, even we might have more mechanical or, or today electronic forms, um, but, but the, it, at its heart, it's still the same process you know, from, from ancient Greece. And so this kind of, again, initiates what we're trying to you know, discuss on the, on the wider scale of, of this exhibit. Um, but we're also kind of tr trying to talk about and, and, and convey in this exhibit the, the debate, again, the, the debates, demands, and decisions, that there are these tensions inherent within democratic processes. So we also, coming from the Spurlock collection, we have a ballot from the 1994 uh, South African election. And you can see on this uh, Nelson Mandela on the ballot for the first time. And so you can see the possibilities of democracy as a, a process um, a, a, in a decolonizing process here in the South African nation. Um, you see this um, Emmeline Pankhurst assigned a photograph of her, the, the famous British suffragette. Again, the fight for women in England having to have the right to vote and, and Pankhurst and her, her suffrage party engaged in very militant activism to bring that about, hunger strikes and mass arrests and, and other acts, uh, uh, demonstrations to again, fight for that right. And then the, the other object we see here is a, it's, it's actually supposed to be mounted on a staff. It's a campaign um, torch uh, from the 19th century, uh, part of the democratic process, part of the electoral process, the participatory process of democracy in the 19th century is there were a lot of nighttime parades. Um, and But this is modeled on a 19th century ballot box. And so you can see a pure ballot box. And this was a new type of ballot box that was vented in the mid 19th century so that you could see the ballots um, as, as they were dropped in. And so this was a way to ensure the uh, reliability of the election. Um, so you would see how many people, you couldn't do ballot stuffing ostensibly, right? You would see how many ballots were going into to the the ballot box at the same time. But in this case, in this artifact, um, the, the globe would have been filled with, with kerosene or some, some sort of flammable um, liquid for, for illumination, but speaks to, again, the concerns and the development of democracy. We see, again, you know, uh, the South African nation participating in full democracy for the first time in 1994, you know, the women's fight for suffrage. And, and we'll see some more suffrage, suffrage artifacts as we continue through the tour. And then the, the importance of the veracity of the, and the integrity of the election is something that has been part of the democratic process in the United States since, since the 19th century. And you can see this made visible and illuminated, literally illuminated in a uh, parade torch from, from the 19th century. But we also want to kind of chart not only kind of the thematic process of democracy, we have to look at the history of democracy and the way it's kind of in, impacting the stuff, again, of politics. This is a theme that I'm going to kind of keep returning to here. And so we've also included from the People's Collection some very early ceramics um, from the uh, colonial period. Here we see on um, the top a, a picture with um, a portion of the Constitution uh, written out. Um, in the middle, we see a memorial uh, water uh, jug for uh, George Washington. And then finally, a mug with a uh, qu extended quote from Benjamin Franklin. And so what we see in this and what you're going to commonly see and you still see today is these political objects are transformed into 
everyday materials so that politics enters your home. It kind of sits, again, these, these are things that are used in the kitchen. They're used when you're serving meals. They are common objects. And so this is an intentional thing so that you're always kind of thinking and seeing about the political process. Um, but you're seeing here, you're seeing more abstract kind of depictions of American politics. These aren't representative of any one party or any one figure. Um, as, as, as many of you may know, George Washington was um, a critic of party systems and didn't want these kinds of divisions to rupture the early American government. And so the object we see here in the middle of this water pitcher is actually a commemorative um, object for his candidacy, for, candidacy for his person. It's not um, a campaign object itself. It's not, um, but it's something you would bring into your home in honor of George Washington. And when you look at the object itself, you can see um, Washington in his military uniform and holding a staff with a um, liberty cap, which is an ancient Greek cap that slaves would wear. And it became a symbol of freedom. And so you see it often in late 19th and or uh, late 18th, early 19th century images kind of depicting democracy, this, this typically red felted cap um, and a variety of iterations. And standing next to Washington, you see Columbia, the female embodiment of the nation, the, the figure who, the pre-Uncle Sam figure who is, who is representing uh, the nation looking at the original colonies, okay? And, and you see Washington kind of bestowing this uh, democratic freedom, this, this democracy, this, this sense of liberty with Columbia upon, upon the wider nation. So you see in these early campaign objects, these early political objects, democracy in abstract. You don't, you don't see the parties, you don't see the divisions, you don't see you know, the partisanship that you're going to see in the later objects as we, as we go through this, this collection. Mm -hmm. But you begin, this begins to change. The emergence of uh, political parties in, in the ensuing elections um, and the need to campaign to, to have these opposing sides begins the kind of development of the stuff of politics. And so here we see some early American uh, political, uh, uh, political ephemera. We see an Andrew uh, Jackson plate and a, a John Quincy Adams uh, uh, jewelry box or, or cigar box uh, humidor. Uh, most likely um, some sort of, of jewelry box. Um, and both of these objects just kind of are, are, are very basic in that they're just depicting the candidate, okay? They're just depicting this figure. Um, unlike today where you would, you would have it wrapped in slogans or you would have a particular message or an image of the candidate, just a very standard um, image. Again, that the office of the presidency, it is bestowed upon these individuals um, and that, uh, they themselves, their character is, is the individual figure, their honor, their character um, is what is being weighed by the general public. There, there's no need to kind of dress it up in anything else. Now, this is going to change um, very, very quickly in the 1840s with, with, with other objects, which we see here. This is um, campaign wear from the election of William Henry Harrison. And this fundamentally changes the way American political uh, campaigning and the way that political objects are perceived in this nation. And, and it, you wouldn't think it necessarily. This is just a cup and saucer, very, very basic. Um, one, it's an object that's going to be in the home. So you're going to see it all the time. But you see the kind of branding of the candidate that is going on. William Henry Harrison, and I'll point it out here, um, had a very particular um, image that he wanted to say, uh, promote about himself. And so you see him here in his military uniform. Okay, so he is the hero of the Battle of Tippecanoe, which um, is is actually the battlefield is, is physically not that far from the Champaign-Urbana campus over in Northwest Indiana. It's about an hour and a half drive, um, if, if you wanna see it. Um, but he's, he's both promoting his, his military prowess, but then also his heritage of being a common figure. So what you see on this um, document or on this um, image is also um, a log cabin and a uh, container of cider, if you'll see it here. So one of the criticisms that was lodged against William Henry, Har William Henry Harrison is that he should just retire on his $2,000 pension um, and a gallon of cider and he would be happy. That, that he was not um, kind of a political figure who had the wherewithal to be president, um, that he was better suited to just staying in a log cabin and, and drinking. And he 
took that upon himself that he actually kind of inverted this image and made it his campaign image. Okay, and so you see his log cabin, you see his gallon of, of hard cider. And what this then begins to promote is that he's a figure of the common man. Okay, so that now people are linking this military figure with this common um, background that, that he you know, came up from nothing, became this military hero, and then ascended to the office of the presidency. And so William Henry Harrison, the materials during his campaign proliferated. There are hundreds of ribbons, there are other objects, and we'll see some more as we kind of progress through this, really changed how politics and campaigning happens. Um, and, and makes more appearances um, than any previous candidate in objects of kind of 19th century um, uh, political culture. Now, if we go to the next slide. Oh, I need to, one moment, I need to remove the annotations. And so you see that here with William Henry Harrison and the object in the middle is a William Henry Harrison snuff box. Okay. Um, you see the branding and the nicknaming of presidents. Now we often think of this with Old Hickory and Andrew Jackson and there was some of that during his candidacy, certainly, but manifesting in physical objects really becomes a Harrison trait that then other candidates really are going to latch on to. And so, you know, we have we have a, a, a very interesting spectrum here of objects kind of showing how candidates are using different nicknames or different images related to their background or, or their history to, again, kind of persuade voters. So again, so in th this middle object, this log cabin, this cider um, jug, we have William Henry Harrison, and then we have Teddy Roosevelt with teddy bears on this uh, plate depicting Teddy digging the Panama Canal, okay? And so we see, again, what emerges during his presidency, um, the creation of the teddy bear, equating it with, with his name um, and kind of being a common object, you know, that then children are going to um, cherish and love for, for generations, um, but linking it to a specific policy platform with his nickname and the digging of the Panama Canal. And the the emergence of kind of a US imperial politics that this is this is then producing. Okay, it, it's demonstrating, because um, Teddy Roosevelt's in the background of this image, it's demonstrating his military prowess, um, his, um, you know, forward thinking and his aggressiveness, his, his carry a big stick, speak softly and carry a big stick attitude, um, and, and US expansion. Okay, but within, again, relying on the nickname of Teddy Roosevelt. Whereas we have on the other end, in, in a much more recent example, we have a, a uh, porcelain Jimmy Carter peanut again so we have the, the the common peanut farmer from Georgia who again linking it to his 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 smile his, his very large smile his background as a farmer again kind of both poking fun at this history but then also equating him with again kind of a common background hearkening back not explicitly but but implicitly to the kind of log cabin attitude of William Henry Harrison, that here's a common man. Here's someone who's connected with the land, who's connected with common people, um, and will then, you know, use that in his, his electoral campaign and hopefully get people to vote for him. And you see, again, this kind of building, this branding of the presidency through the 19th century. Um, and, and as a lot of things with the presidency is, is epitomized by Teddy Roosevelt. Um, you see here a, a glass dish uh, with a number of other teddy bear images, okay, equating Teddy Roosevelt. But you see other attributes of his life um, also embossed on this. You see uh, the square deal, the one of his campaign platform, um, that America needs a new square deal um, with, with economic regulation and, and um, support for um, the working class and, and agricultural interests. You see uh, his Rough Riders uh, cap and rifles. Um, you see these different attributes of him being promoted, but then also, again, the teddy bears, again, kind of speaking to his nickname, speaking to the branding. Um, and the other objects also, again, emphasizing his military history, this, this uh, tin or aluminum uh, a beer tray is is what it is with Teddy Roosevelt as a rough rider during the Spanish American War. You know, here is this strong military figure, you know, who who was victorious at the Battle of San Juan Hill. And you see that then also in this other object, this small bust of Teddy Roosevelt. 
And in each of these objects, you see an object that someone would put into their home that they would proudly display, either more as just a decorative object like this, this glass tray, um, something that, is, that actually has some sort of um, utilitarian value with, with the aluminum tray, or something that you would display in your study or on your mantle or on a shelf with this bust of Theodore Roosevelt. And so we can see, again, how these political objects are both to signify your support, but that they're just a regular object you're going to put in your home to kind of signify and demonstrate your commitment to this political figure and their particular agenda. And it wouldn't be, um, you know, a conversation about politics and the presidency and the objects of campaigns without talking about those particular figures who are tied to the state of Illinois. And Illinois has had an abundance of um, members who have either sought the presidency or achieved uh, their presidential ambitions. And so we see in this case, Abraham Lincoln. And so this campaign plate um, depicting Abraham Lincoln is actually a really unique um, artifact. And we're going to see it, we're going to see another one for for Winfield Scott later, but it's a, a plate for a child. Um, so again, when you're seeing the, the ways that politics are kind of coming into people's homes, um, this plate, as you'll notice around the edges, it has the alphabet. And so this was a object that both had uh, political uh, undertones, right, kind of depicting the president, um, but also of use for a child. Um, and so this actually stems from after, this is uh, 1864 and later after, uh, during his reelection campaign. Um, but a child would, you know, be eating out of it, using the plate, uh, but then also practicing their letters. So there's also a practical um, use for it, but it's reinforcing again, kind of the image of Lincoln, uh, specifically mentioning his title again. So you're seeing how politics are kind of coming into the home and coming into everyday life, you know, at a very young age, even. Um, juxtaposed with this are two vases, one with Abraham Lincoln and one with Ulysses S. Grant. And so this set of vases, um, specifically from um, the Grant administration, when Grant is running for president, is intentionally linking him to the um, visage of Abraham Lincoln and to his memory. Um, so you see Ulysses S. Grant depicted in his military uniform, um, but which is, is one of the aspects that he is particularly campaigning on his, his success in the Civil War and his uh, defeat of the Confederacy make him, you know, the candidate um, in during his election, but also again, wanting to see him as a continuation of the legacy of the martyred president. And so these objects, again, would be put into the home, you would use them to display flowers or things. And again, you would see this important military figure, you would see the martyred president linking them together. And again, just kind of reinforcing this connection um, and, and um, the importance of Ulysses S. Grant. And we see, again, the, the way that these Illinois presidential aspirants, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a wide spectrum of, you know, because of Illinois has had so many um, who have tried to achieve the presidency and some, some who have, um, that you have, a copy of, of Abraham Lincoln's um, death mask, a bronzed copy of Abraham Lincoln's death mask, which is from the Spurlock collection. But what we see here in the middle is Grover Cleveland and his vice presidential running mate, um, Adelaide Stevenson, who is the grandfather of then Adelaide Stevenson um, of the 1950s and 60s. And so you can see both, you know, the martyred president, the um, importance that he is bringing to the nation, the sacrifices that he brought, um, is, is all of you know, having, having attended at the University of Illinois and been at the University of Illinois, um, Abraham Lincoln still remains a, a figure um, central to kind of the image of politics and, and history of the state. Now, the Adelaide Stevenson's not so much. They don't have the same traction. They don't have the, the um, kind of importance to American civic religion, but you nonetheless, they are important figures. And, and maybe some of you have been up to Bloomington where, where both of them are buried. Um, but you can see the way that their campaigns are being depicted in these objects. And you can also see the kind of change in depictions of the presidency from, you know, this, this grave image of this martyred figure, this, this bronze death mask to a, you know, a disposable cup that's a little fun. You know, here's, here's um, Adelaide um, smiling and laughing and, and, and um, you know, seeking your vote um, in the 1950s. Um, the other kind of important Illinois political figures that we also chose to highlight and, and draw out of this collection are some, are, are one you've almost certainly heard of and one you may have not, um, 
And that's William Jennings Bryan, the born in Salem, Illinois, uh, south of Urbana-Champaign, but attended uh, college in uh, Jacksonville at Illinois College. He makes his career, though, in Nebraska, first as a congressman for the first district, Nebraska, um, but in, elected in 1890, but finally achieving um, the nomination for the Democratic Party and the Populist Party in 1896, again in 1890, and then in 1908. So he holds the record for the most uh, major party nominations and then losses um, for the presidency. And with his election, um, or with his campaign in 1896, the, the animating issue was the monetary policy of the United States was whether we should continue the gold standard or whether we should have a bimetal standard where we should have silver um, at a ratio of, of 16 ounces to one ounce um, for one ounce of gold um, to increase the, the currency flow within the United States. And Brian was of the silver platform. And so that's what this, this little bug is here in the middle. That's a silver bug. Um, and so silver rights and supporters of the silver policy in 1896 would have little buttons, or in this case, it's, it's, a, it's a much larger metal um, object depicting their support for the silver plan. You would also have a competing gold bug kind of image, but this was the animating factor for Brian's candidacy in 1896, and, and he would also run on it in 1890. Um, but Brian was... Uh, really revolutionary when it came to presidential politics. Um, when he ran against William McKinley, both in 1896 and 1890, um, he conducted whistle stop tours, which were, were relatively unprecedented. Um, it was seen at the time period that the presidency was not something you actively campaigned for, that that was unbecoming of the office, that it was something that was bestowed upon you by the nation. Um, and so you had surrogates who went out and did the stump speaking. You had others go out and speak on your behalf. You had others endorse your candidacy and do you know, the, the campaigning and the politicking that was required to achieve the office. But Brian being a figure who, who tried to represent a, a populist vision of America, really truly trying to represent the people, um, wanted to connect with them. And given his notoriety as a very powerful orator, he, his skill set was um, directed towards engaging with people one on one. And so he traveled around the country and, and he stopped in places like Champaign Urbana um, at, a, at a number of occasions uh, during his career and, and gave these incredible oratorical uh, addresses, you know, speaking about the issues, really engaging with people. And so for the first time, people were coming into contact with presidential candidates. Um, whereas William McKinley was running what was called a front porch campaign. He stayed at his home in Ohio and people came to him um, and visited him. Um, this was partially due to his wife who had um, a pretty significant illness um, and he didn't wanna be away from home, but, but did not do as much active campaigning as William Jennings Bryan. Now, Brian does ultimately lose in 1896 and, and 1900, but during the 1900 campaign, which was a rematch against William McKinley, um, William McKinley had a very young and very active vice president by the name of Theodore Roosevelt, who took on that idea of whistle-stop touring and engaging with um, the public, and again, pushed the, the, the whistle-stop tour to um, new ends, and also was very active and engaging with a wide variety of constituents. And so you see the, even the way that politics is happening and campaigning is happening, changing at this point in time. And it's, and it's from Brian. And it's really a skill that he develops when he's at Illinois College. He's on the debate team there, um, where one of, one of the competitors that he would compete against, and there's photographs of them, um, is Jane Adams from uh, the founder of Hull House. But at the time, she's at the, the um, Rockport Seminary. Um, the other figure, and this is someone who doesn't have kind of the national notoriety that, that he, he did at the time, is, is Joe Cannon, Uncle Joe. Um, and he was the Speaker of the House at the turn of the century, beginning in 1903. And he's from Danville, Illinois. So again, just, just a little east of, of Champaign-Urbana. And he was one of the, and if not the most powerful Speaker of the House of Representatives, a longtime Republican politician. Um, he was appointed to his first political office by Abraham Lincoln. Um, 
and so had had a long and very storied career um, by the time he, he took the speaker's gavel in 1903. And so Joe Cannon was an instrumental figure in the Theodore Roosevelt administration um, and kind of directing and, and impeding a lot of Roosevelt's policies um, and, and became a very influential figure in Washington and a very um, influential figure on the national stage. And so this is why you see uh, the Joe Cannon brand uh, cigars that have the image of um, the Capitol and then his visage. Um, you know, and for, you could get 10 of them for a quarter, which is a, which is a pretty good deal for a cigar in, in 1903, 1904. Um, so these Illinois politicians, these figures kind of from the wider Champaign-Urbana area really had an impact kind of on, on the community. And we can, we can certainly talk about more of them in, in the question and answer. The most recent kind of notable, again, um, Illinois political figure is, is obviously um, Barack Obama. And so this is one of, again, one of the unique artifacts we were able to bring out from the uh, Spurlock's wider collection. And so uh, this piece of fabric is actually from Tanzania from 2008. And so you can see the, the wider global impact of American democracy. And particularly, again, this, this Illinois politician who does, you know, succeed on the international stage and what he meant to not just in the United States, but a wider global audience, you know, the election of the first black president and how that resonated um, in different parts of Africa. And so this is one of the first objects when you come into the museum and see, and again, kind of seeing how the American political process and the stuff of politics is, is being reflected and refracted in, in areas beyond, beyond the United States. Um, so it's a very, very interesting object. And again, shows the strengths and the uniqueness of the collections at, at the Spurlock Museum. The other thing about kind of depicting politics and looking at the stuff of politics, right, is, is also kind of thinking about the also rans, right, that there are for, for every successful, you know, political candidate, there are, um, you know, dozens of those who, who have uh, tried to achieve um, political office for, for a variety of different levels um, who are not successful. And so we also tried to include some of those artifacts from, from, from unsuccessful campaigns or earlier campaigns and kind of talking about, you know, why these figures necessarily didn't didn't um, you know uh, succeed or 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 just you know kind of to reflect on their campaign? So we have here a General Winfield Scott plate from 1852 when he runs um, for the presidency and ultimately unsuccessful. And this is a similar plate to the Abraham Lincoln plate, where it's a child's plate with the alphabet around the edge. And so again, you see the candidate in your home. It's it's articulating his military prowess as the hero of the Mexican-American War. Um, and then he would, at the very beginning of the Civil War, he would also be leading um, the entirety of the Union forces. Um, but again, uh, emphasizing that his military strength, his military um, career, but then again, it's an object for a child. So you're seeing these common everyday objects. You also see then the Michael Dukakis and the James G. Blaine um, cigarette and cigar uh, boxes, uh, reflect uh, uh, respectively. And so you can kind of see how you're, you're also kind of putting the candidate on people's vices, um, if you will. Um, the, the Dukakis cigarettes are, are unopened from, from the 88 campaign, whereas the, the James G. Blaine are empty. And, and Blaine um, was both one of the, the most powerful politicians of the 19th century, but, but also um, considered one of the most corrupt. Um, and so when he runs against Grover Cleveland in the 1880s, that's what ultimately sinks his candidacy, that even though he has had um, multiple, um, he's been Secretary of State, he's, he's, he's held a number of positions and has been, been incredibly influential, um, he's not able to um, kind of mount a successful campaign. And so he's, he's largely forgotten today, but in the 19th century, he was a dominating figure on the American political scene. Um, we've also included objects, you know, that relate to other aspects kind of of American political life. So when we think about the, the different types of policies and the decisions that, that politicians make, um, they often reverberate well outside the United States. And this is reflected in the stuff of these politics. And so you can see here a milk glass battleship. Okay. And this is from um, the, the, late 19th, early 20th century, more than likely making reference to the Great White Fleet that Theodore Roosevelt sent around the world to demonstrate the power of the United States Navy. And you see Uncle Sam sitting on top of that. And so this little dish, right, this really seemingly innocuous dish um, is, is depicting kind of American military might, but then also its global 
prowess, these kind of imperial ambitions that the United States has in the late 19th and early 20th century. And you also see that then reflected in these other two objects, this, this um, um, little box says, maintain the Monroe Doctrine, America for Americans. Again, this idea that um, the, the United States has the obligation to defend um, the Western Hemisphere from incursions from European powers. So again, you're seeing this articulation of a global power. And then um, at the bottom, a Theodore Roosevelt Rough Rider um, uh, harmonica. So again, you're seeing the Spanish-American War, kind of the entanglements of the United States in these imperial conflicts of the late 19th century, you know, in, in a fun, um, you know, musical kind of way. Again, an everyday object that would be in the home, um, but would always kind of have that reminder that, okay, it, it, it's referencing Theodore Roosevelt's military career, it's referencing the Spanish-American War, San Juan Hill, and the um, conflict in Cuba. So you see, again, as we saw with, with the cloth from, from Tanzania, the global reach of kind of these American political things. You're also kind of seeing just the, the change in campaigning um, with the evolution and what we try to, to show with the exhibit is, you know, at the very beginning, uh, campaigning was as, as the torch, right? The, the ballot box torch was something that um, was uh, involved parades at night, masses of groups of people, okay? Um, but as politics became less participatory like that, you're not having massive parades of kind of local voters or local supporters demonstrating. It became much more individualized. Um, and so you see the automobile becoming a vehicle for um, political change. And so we've included a number of objects that kind of show how Americans are then branding their automobiles. And so you're, you're, they're you know, spreading their, their political message um, wherever they drive, right? And so we have two um, license plate uh, toppers from Alf Landon from the, the 1936 campaign, we see a uh, license plate topper uh, with uh, FDR with uh, Uncle Sam. Um, also um, from the 1930s, and then finally a Barry Goldwater action figure um, that is the sticker noted uh, sticks to your dashboard. Um, and so as you're driving around, you know, in 1964, everybody could see that that you're um, a, a Goldwater supporter. You supporter. You have this 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 cute little little Goldwater action figure on your dashboard. So again, seeing how. Um, the space where these political objects is, is changing. It's not just being common objects in your home. It's not just badges and things you're wearing, but it's also um, you know, becoming something that you're now decorating your autom automobile with. And so you're presenting your politics to everybody, no matter where you go. Um, and we, again, see the kind of common everyday political artifact um, and the way that politics are kind of shaping you know, basic things. Here we have a, a Chester Arthur um, cigar art, um, label a, a Knights of Labor who were in 1880s um, political or a, a labor union a, a, the most uh, prominent labor union of the 19th century um, in, in, a, in a glass and then finally a, um, a James A. Garfield uh, cologne bottle and so you see politics and activism entering um, everyday spaces again dishware uh, smoking and then just smelling good you see the politician there you see the politics Okay. And again, just to kind of speak to these everyday objects and more things that you would see in the exhibit, a, a Woodrow Wilson waterproof matchstick cover and uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower disposable cup, a William McKinley and Theodore Roosevelt uh, razor blade. Uh, so every morning when, when you're shaving, um, you're going to see William McKinley and Teddy Roosevelt staring right back at you in, in the bathroom mirror. A William McKinley cane, but it has a kazoo at the top. And so again, so when you're marching, when you're um, um, you know depicting your support for the president um, and his candidacy, you you can make some noise. And then and then finally a a pencil um, for uh, Herbert Hoover's um, reelection in um, 1932. But we also wanted to depict the the attributes and aspects of activism and how voting has been had changed. And a lot of these artifacts and, and the things that you're going to see. In the exhibit, um, we have a lot of photographs from contemporary uh, political movements from, from Black Lives Matter, from, from Tea Party protests, um, and, and protests within uh, the Champaign-Urbana area to kind of show 
how politics isn't just isn't just the presidency. It's not just these elections. And we have a number of artifacts from the People's Collection who kind of show one of the major fights for that in the 20th century, and that's the fight for women's suffrage. And there are a number of artifacts um, that come from the, the British fight for um, the women's right to vote. And they're very, very interesting artifacts for, for um, a number of reasons, but I want to kind of focus on the, the dish and the cup and then the pin. So these are both from the British suffrage fight, but they're a very, very unique type of suffrage artifact that were given out by the Pankhursts um, for those who had been imprisoned. So the logo on both the cup and the saucer and then the pin, it's the portcullis of the London jail. And it has the, the colors um, and a modification of the logo of the prison in London where these women are being detained. So the only way you could actually obtain these objects and, and were gifted these objects is that you were imprisoned for the fight for women's suffrage in the United Kingdom. And so these objects depict, again, the lengths that people went to to participate in democratic processes and how then that is manifested in stuff and how um, that these objects then kind of demonstrate the commitment to that process, to voting, to democracy. Um, and we also have um, more humorous aspects, which you're also kind of seeing the critics of women's suffrage, okay, in these, in the porcelain objects with, with the, the uh, woman with her crossed arms, with the, with the iron figure, which is more than likely a, a children's toy. And then this um, interesting doll set with, with uh, the police officer arresting a suffragette. All of these are coming from England. And they're all kind of, you're seeing both um, you know, a criticism of suffragettes, making them looking dour and angry. But you're also again seeing um, the suffragettes as as a common everyday object, something that would be a child's toy. Again, so so with the Abraham Lincoln and the Winfield Scott plate, you're seeing children kind of engaging with these political objects, reinforcing the the particular aims of of these movements. Now, I hope you've enjoyed kind of our our, our brief overview through the collection. Um, you know, I'm 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 really excited and I'm really thankful that we were able to pull this off um, amidst the pandemic. And I hope that all of you um, will have the opportunity to kind of explore and engage with these materials directly and and see the exhibit in person sometime soon. Thank you. And and now I'll take questions. Okay, I think I'm back. So Nathan, I really appreciate uh, the presentation. I, it was fascinating to me. Um, while I see if there are any questions in the chat, a couple actually occurred to me. Um, so the one is, uh, I was really moved at first by all the children's act the plates mm -hmm. and things that were just made for children. And I thought, wow, that's pretty subliminal. We don't seem to see that today. And then I caught myself saying, well, yeah, but how many times do we see onesies, you know, with candidates' names blasted across for, you know, for babies? But um, it, it still occurs to me that all of those common objects that are used for children um, feels like we don't do that as much today as we did then. It, do you, is, is that a correct assessment or am I just sort of, you know, sort of numb to what's going on in, in the current contemporary environment? Well, you know, you see things like, um, you know, there's action figures, you can get bobbleheads. I mean, you, you still see kind sure. of those things. It might not necessarily be as explicit, um, but it, it can, it depends on the election. It kind of depends on the party um, and it depends on the candidate, you know, if they're particularly marketable as, you know, a, 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 some sort of, some sort of figure like that. Um, but you don't see things as explicit as that, where it's, it's some sort of children's educational, you know, they're kind of wrapping it in that. You, you'll still see, um, you might have like a placemat, you know, with all the presidents on it that, that your, your child has. So you can kind of, they can learn about, you know, the presidency, but it wouldn't be an explicit campaign object, right? Yes, um, yeah. But yeah, you'll still see, you know, action figures, maybe stickers at a parade, um, but nothing, nothing as explicit as, as as that as as you saw in the, in the 19th century um so maybe this is a build on that the other thing that struck me is um it may be how i the way i interpret this personally is how we've devolved it, and not necessarily in a good way so early on as you mentioned they weren't really campaigning per se but were touting democratic principles and then you move into an era where they were actually then touting themselves. And mm -hmm. the thing that I found interesting was that obviously great care was taken in terms of what the image of themselves 
mm-hmm. was intended to per, per, um, portray. So whether they were a military hero, whether they were global or, or all those things, but it, it seemed like a lot of care and thought went into that. Mm-hmm. Whereas I think about the campaigns, even the materials today, and, and other than the Obama example that you provided, um, it seems to be much more in your face and less about particular things that they believe they should be known for or, or part of their personal brand, which you know, may be endemic when I think about you know, all the debates in the campaign election things that we have now. It's more about not about who they are and what they want to be known for, but why you, know, they sh- you should vote for them versus the other person and, and more about tearing down the other person than voting what you represent. And, and do you find that it, in the history of the materials that that, that has, um, rings true a little bit as well? Well, what, what you have is you have a big kind of change in who's, who's determining kind of the courses of campaigns. So in the 19th century, um, politics is, is very participatory um, and that everybody in the community is engaged with it. Um, and so you have, again, for the example of the um, torches, I mean, you have these, these enormous candle lit or torch lit parades that everybody in the community is participating in. Um, and Abraham Lincoln had a group that supported him called the Wide Awakes, who kind of wore these military-esque uniforms and, and would put on these great um, parades. And they were happening in communities all across you know, the, the, the country. Um, there was Abraham Lincoln had a campaign parade down University Avenue in, in Champaign-Urbana um, in, um, um, when he was running for Senate. Um, and, and everybody in the community was there. Okay. Um, but as you kind of see a shift away from everybody kind of participating as the candidates themselves get more directly involved um, and you begin to have kind of a, a group of um, experts and you have polling and you have, um, you know, different kinds of things that really begins to shift, right? Um, and, and you have, again, the kind of politics that we have today. Um, which is, is less necessarily about kind of the, the character of the individual people or the image that they're trying to promote as it is the, you know, denigration of the, the other candidate. Yeah, I, I, think that, I think that's right. So as you think about this incredible collection, and I think it is an incredible collection, so it's a fascinating conversation. What are considered, one of the questions we got are, what is considered the most popular or most collectible campaign related objects? Well, I mean, it kind of depends on on the collector, right? I mean, Abraham Lincoln stuff is is going to be the most pricey. I mean, and George Washington stuff. Again, if it's a if it's a particular candidate, right, that was highly influential, um, or the there's a scarcity of material, right? Um, George Washington didn't actually produce campaign materials, but but there were, I think, like a very like forty different uh, buttons and and the the gla- the the porcelainware, right, that we saw. Um, that were produced in honor of him. And so those are particularly pricey. Um, a- anything related to Abraham Lincoln is, is very, very popular. Um, and due to the condition issues is, you know, is gonna be difficult to come upon. Um, there's also the famous um, case, and the Smithsonian now has this, in the 1950s, um, two young boys in Massachusetts found the only known Thomas Jefferson campaign flag besides some railroad tracks in a box. Um, and they took it to, sh- they found it in a box, they took it to show and tell, and, and it, it got some press that, you know, here's a flag from um, um, 1800, 1802, um, um, you know, that, that it was just, they, again, they found it in a box and the Smithsonian was eventually able to purchase it um, and is now on display there. But, um, you know, it, again, it depends on the individual collector. You know, a lot of folks will collect things from the election that they remember, right? Maybe it was the first time that they participated in an election. Um, so consequently, you know, for, for a certain generation, it's, it's JFK things, right? Um, people really enjoy, um, you know, having the posters or, or if it's a campaign that has a unique object. Again, the, the JFK campaign, right? He had the PT-109 um, tie clips, which, which he would, JFK would, would give out on the campaign trail. And those were, were very, very popular. Um, you know, others collect based on their local, um, th- their local municipality or their local kind of elections, stuff that, that is produced in much smaller numbers and a lot harder to come by. Um, but, you know, buttons are always really popular because they're mass produced, they're easy to come by, they can be relatively inexpensive. Um, 
bumper stickers are also you know popular for, for more recent campaigns um posters are also also very popular um but again the, the, there's certain precedents that stuff is more popular for and and usually due to the scarcity of the material or or the particular impact that they might have had um you know people are much more excited about theodore roosevelt stuff than they are about william mckinley yeah sure so how did um, early candidates make contact with people beyond their, their local community? I mean, we think, you know, the, the internet and media is so ubiquitous today. Um, was it through parades? I mean, what is that why there were so many objects that actually showed the candidates that were distributed? Mm -hmm. you, you would see objects, their, their um, speeches would get reproduced, you know, in the local paper. Um, but yeah, that was, I mean, that's the importance of, of having these objects is just spreading the image of the candidate when the candidate themselves could not be out there, um, but you would you would have you know stump speeches and you would have kind of local politicians. This is how William Jennings Bryan back back in Nebraska really came to the forefront because he was a a surrogate speaker for for a lot of other political campaigns and so would travel around the state when he was just a young mm -hmm. attorney and and due to his rhetorical skill representing others in and of himself became a, a notable figure and, and people were then like, well, you should run, you need to run for office, you need, you need to you know, use your gifts. Um, so as, as candidates were able to kind of come into contact with people more and more, you see, you also kind of see the stuff changing. It doesn't necessarily just have to have their face on it. It can be a little funnier. It can, it can have you know, more slogans and things as people understand who the candidates are. You, need to, you, you can emphasize other things, um, unlike in the 19th century. Yeah, so um, we only have a couple minutes left. So I'm going to ask one uh, last question to you, Nathan. So mm -hmm. what's your favorite collectible in this collection? Well, in this collection, the thing, um, and and the the folks who are who are helping with us know this. Um, as as someone who uh, teaches in Nebraska, is from Nebraska, and uh, but went to school in Illinois, I have a a, a, a deep um, interest in William Jennings Bryan. And so my favorite stuff in in was was actually the William Jennings Bryan materials. Um, and so I find the campaign of 1896. It's one of the things that that um, is part of my research. So those objects were always very fascinating to me, just because the issue of silver just doesn't really make all that much sense. And so actually, um, and and um, if you can all see it, I have my very own um, William James Bryan 1896 campaign cane, and there's also one in the exhibit. Um, and so um, those are the objects that I was I was particularly interested in. That's great. Um, well, Elizabeth Nathan, thank you so much for um, for all your great information. This was it was fascinating to me, Nathan. Uh, it me, really wants to motivate me to get to campus um, to see the collection myself. But thanks for everybody in the audience. Thank you for attending today's event. We hope when you're on campus ne next, you'll stop at the Spurlock Museum to see this exhibit. Be on the lookout in mid-November for information about how to access the recordings for all the LA Impact event, LAS Impact events. And thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of your day.